Hi everyone, this is Lydia Bryseth, the manager of Coloring Colorado, and I'm here today with Anne Marie Forster Liu, who's a teacher in Montgomery uh, County Public Schools in Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. And we're really happy to be here today on Facebook Live. We're going to be talking about building relationships with English language learners, immigrant students, ELL families, and how that leads to advocacy throughout the year. Thank you so much for being here, Anne Marie. Thank you for having me. Especially right before the school year starts, which is such a busy time, and you have just a little bit time left on summer vacation, so thank you. Uh, we want to take a moment to thank our uh, partner, the National Education Association, and they have made this series of Facebook Live events possible, so thank you to the NEA. They also have created a great uh, resource guide about advocating for English language learners, which you can find on Coloring Colorado. Thank you, NEA. And we always take every opportunity to thank the American Federation of Teachers, our founding partner as well. They have been with us from the beginning and have made a lot of great content possible on Coloring Colorado. So thank you, NEA, AFT. If we have NEA or AFT members, please be sure to say hello. We look forward to hearing everybody's comments, questions, like us, share us as the post goes on, and uh, then the archive will be available here on Facebook as well as on Coloring Colorado. So we have all of our housekeeping uh, details taken care of, and I want to jump right in. Uh, with uh, Anne Marie. So, if you would just tell us about your district, the ELL and immigrant population there, as well as your current role. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I'm a high school teacher in Montgomery County, and our district is has a huge ESOL population and um, a very diverse one. And we have a dynamic ESOL department that has a lot of resources for families and for the students and the teachers. So it's a very great place to grow up as an ESOL teacher. So um, my role right now as a high school teacher is to really work with the students at the beginning level as well as the intermediate level. So and it's very high broad. school is new, oh, newer it for you. It is a you, new adventure for right? me. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I started out in middle school. And that was uh, an enjoyable, very strong learning experience for me. And I went to elementary school for several years, and now I'm in high school. So I'm getting an um, experience across the grade levels. And that's one reason we're happy to talk to you today, oh. because you can sort of speak to different age levels and needs mm -hmm. and relationships there. So that's great. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, start by saying that I didn't mention in the introduction is that you had won this great award in 2013, mm -hmm. the TESOL National Teacher of the Year. It's an honor. In mm -hmm. part because of your fabulous advocacy for uh, English language learners. and. Um, I know a lot of that for you is building relationships with kids, getting to know kids, and so I want to start by saying why, why is that important to you? Well, I think that it, it's important to me as a human being because I want that same respect, but I also feel like it's important, um, it makes learning more possible, um, but it also is it's, it's the bottom line. I, I mean, I, my training included Maslow, and so we know that social, emotional safety and security is a huge part of the learning process and the becoming human process. And I think that students, when they trust you, they will work for you. Um, and none of us is perfect at it, but if we're willing to work hard, and willing to see students for who they are as they present themselves and understand that they have challenges that we don't even see and just respect the fact that they are bringing things to the classroom that we don't even understand we can't understand so um, just respecting them building that relationship so that they're willing to share when they feel comfortable sharing um, and when they trust you, they'll work with you. So we have kind of our big picture, broad strokes. This is why we're doing this. So let's yes. let's uh, dig in a little bit, particularly at the beginning of the school year. What are some of the things that you're doing and thinking about as you're getting ready to meet a new group of students? Yeah. High school's a little bit different. And one of my supervisors said, you know, their personalities are pretty strong at this age. And I felt um, my first year in high school, I wanted them to present themselves to me in a very safe way. So we talked a lot about 
who are you, what is it, and it was in a using reading and writing. But then I used an online format for them to talk to me. So they didn't have to write about themselves, but they had to talk to me about themselves. And my basic question was, tell me something about you that I can't see. And um, one of the most impactful ones was a young woman who said, you can't tell that I have trouble making friends. And so that told me a lot as a teacher that when I group her and if I ask her to work with someone and she slightly recoils that I need to respect the fact that it's troublesome for her. And so I think if you just get to know your kids enough to say, I, will you trust me? I want you to trust me. They will give you the information you need in order to proceed with the lessons. And how did you think about that when you were working at middle school and elementary levels? Um, in elementary school, a big smile and a, a lot of positive body language works really well. And I've learned that working with the families, too. Um, because they're going to talk about you. One of my principals always said, you are dinner conversation. Um, so it's really important to me for the kids to come up and say, oh, she's here. She's here for me. And it's a great thing, right? It doesn't always happen. Sometimes they'd rather stay in their classroom. Um, but if you build that opportunity for them to know that they are welcomed and they are respected, um, they'll give back. And so body language in elementary school, talk about yourself in high school, and middle school, it's sort of in between. <laughs> um, in middle school, consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, do they trust what you're going to do? Do they know what you're going to do? And I'm not perfect at it, but I realized when things went awry that I had missed something. And usually it was consistency. I didn't do what I told them I was going to do. So um, consistency is a big factor That's great. for middle schoolers. I think it's really helpful to have the perspective of saying it, it, it is different by age. Mm -hmm. And um, there are different needs that are developmentally appropriate as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in sharing some of these thoughts with mainstream colleagues, content area teachers, people who don't have training and background in working with English language learners, what are some steps they can take, particularly at the beginning of the year? Well, primarily that um, being very predictable and um, consistent in your body language towards an English learner. Um, it always has to be open and welcoming um, because they will read your body language before they understand your words. Um, even our more advanced English learners really depend on that body language. Um, and I think that teachers at being human, you know, we have our ups and downs too. We have our stressful days. The kids clue into that. They know when you're stressed. And so being honest with yourself and saying, oh, maybe his behavior is related to my level of stress, or you know, how are they working together, and maybe adjusting a little bit. I think that in elementary school, really approaching the parents first, um, making sure that they know that you will take care of their child because their child is in a different environment than the parents understand. And so um, building that trust with parents on day one, during orientation, during back to school night, um, letting them walk their child to class the first couple of times, and then starting to build independence with the child, it's OK. Like just having that little bit of flexibility to build that trust with the parents. And so thinking about getting to know families, I think it's easy to feel like you can make a misstep or you can overstep, but at the same time, if you don't put any effort in, then you don't get anything out of it. How, how do you sort of find that balance of 
getting to know a family, getting to know their story without making them feel uncomfortable by asking too many questions. Yeah. I don't generally ask a lot of questions of the parents because the answers will, will reveal themselves. So if you have your radar up and you're in tune with the student, you'll know when the family's stressed. You'll know by um, whether or not the child has a coat at winter time or whether or not they um, have lunch regularly. You'll find clues where you can help the families. Um, and the way I prefer to help the families is to show them where the resources are. Um, and I think that they respect that because then they are still providing for their child. It's not an outside source providing for their child. And I know that I've used my, my colleagues, um, I use the word use, that's not fair, but I've relied on my colleagues as much as possible um, to help me. So in one of my elementary schools, the registrar was so phenomenal with the parents, especially of the, well, all the parents, but for me, especially my students, um, felt very welcomed by her. And if they ever needed anything, she was their go-to resource. And to have an environment like that and build an environment like that is so important for the families. And a lot of that responsibility falls on administrators, right? To be looking at their staff, to be looking at the culture and tone of the school. And I'm sure you've seen that in sort of different gradations of the different environments that you've worked in. And I think that they do that. They do that for every student in their school. Um, the thing for English learners is that they are, it's critical for them. It's, it's the difference between some families choosing not to come to school. You know, if they don't trust you, in certain times they may not bring their students to school. Or their child is not feeling well, I'll keep them home because I'm not sure that they'll be okay at school. Whereas we have all the resources we need at school, so bring your child to school. Not when they're, they're they have something that they can pass on to someone else, but a little sniffle should not keep them from coming to school. I do know that there are some principals who have a bilingual advisory group on their PTA. Um, they weren't the ones that created it, but they are definitely part of the PTA. And the, when the PTA creates something like that, they're filling a need within the community. And I think that's a positive way that families can be brought into the school, whether that's at the high school, middle, or um, elementary level. We had a, a counselor at one school where I worked, and she always arranged for there to be an ambassador for the child, um, the new children to the school. And sometimes they spoke the same language, and sometimes they didn't. But it, it was leadership within the students already there. That's community building. They're proud of their school, they want to show it off, but it's also welcoming to the new children. And I think, you know, just thinking at like every level from the students themselves all the way up through the staff, through the front office staff, through the parent community, through the administrators, there are all these things that people can be doing. But it seems to me like the sort of the nexus of all that is the ESOL specialist because they may be able to kind of connect the dots for people and help. Um, uh, grease the wheels a little bit of building the relationships, right? I'd like to celebrate a colleague who started a bookmobile. Um, <laughs> because bookmobile was when I was a kid, so it was kind of nice to hear that again. But it, she started a bookmobile and her principal worked with her on it. And they drove around the neighborhoods giving out books in the summer. And um, I think that that's a great way to say we're glad you're here. Here's a book. Literacy is important to us. And enjoy. We'll be back around to trade off books. And um, it gets them into the community, seeing the students that they have, where they live. Um, and it's inobtrusive. So. What do you see? Um, because part of your advocacy is not only for the English language learners, immigrant students, and families themselves, but for your colleagues, for your, mm -hmm. for your profession, really. Yes. So what do you see as some steps that um, 
ESOL and bilingual teachers and educators, paraprofessionals um, can take to sort of build their confidence and start pushing those ideas out a little bit more into their school community? Um, I think that it's, it's um, we all have different experiences and some of us are in teaching environments where there's a lot of pushback <clears throat> and some of us are in teaching environments that are very embracing. So you have that spectrum, right? Um, and I found that for me, um, working with teachers one-on-one, -on -one, like I was honored when a teacher would come and say, I'm doing this lesson today, how do I make this make sense to my students? And then she might go, oh, well, why can't I do that for all my kids? And all that I've done is weave in the language objective with the content objective. It's not, um, so that's advocating on a very quiet and, and incremental basis. Um, I think that ESOL teachers, if given the platform, um, should feel comfortable helping people discuss data in the school and how data is not always the full picture for an ESOL student. Um, we have to have data. It doesn't uh, always give us good feelings when we get the data, but there's reasons why the data reflects what it does. Um, and having that critical conversation with school leadership is important. Um, another thing is, at the high school level, we have so many other teachers that interact with English learners. Um, helping them feel confident working with English learners, I think, is important. Uh, I've only been teaching for one year in high school, but in middle school, they felt com comfortable working with English learners um, because it was an open conversation. It wasn't a those are your kids, it was a shared accountability, it was what can we do together to help these students. When teachers feel success with their English learners, they want more. It's, it's like a piece of candy. <laughs> and when you, when you are successful with some of your harder students to teach, it, it feels good when you're successful. So if you can reach out and find um, people to help you be successful, you'll enjoy it more. I wanted to uh, jump in and see um, if we can uh, get into a little bit more detail about a particular population that you have in Montgomery County, which are unaccompanied minors, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll let you take it away. Um, I think that we have unaccompanied minors all over the country, um, and because of law, we're not supposed to ask, are you undocumented? Um, but the unaccompanied minors, they come to us with a, a big word that's a very painful word to hear is trauma. They come to us with trauma, usually, and um, they're reuniting with family that they haven't seen for a long time or not reuniting with anyone at all, so very alone. And one of my colleagues created this beautiful program, a toolkit, um, of course, with all the staff around her, um, so many names to um, share. But I, I just want to say that if, if you can get a group of colleagues around you, really think about these kids, these undocumented or unaccompanied minors, really understand what they're going through and how that plays out in school and in the classroom or whether or not they come to school at all. Um, it's important to gather all those minds around, critically think about it, and help others learn what you learn. And that's exactly what they did in Montgomery County, and they created um, a toolkit for working with students on accompanied minors. Um, and I would stretch that to say students who are surviving trauma. So, um, you can replicate that in other jurisdictions. Um, you can find out what it is, what are the mental health issues, what are the social emotional issues that are impacting your students, and create the same kind of toolkit. What is this district going to do to support its teachers who are supporting these students? Um, because the teachers otherwise 
don't have that community around them. And when you're dealing with such difficult issues, you need that community around you. And what are some of the uh, ways that trauma presents itself in the classroom? Um, there's um, withdrawal. There's um, fear, like connecting with other students. Uh, such a strong lack of trust. Um, and then you'll see when they start start trying to, they need to take control of their situation. And one of the clues that I've had before is when a student is taking control, they pick one person. And it's usually the ESOL teacher or one of the other ESOL students in the class. Um, ESOL tends to be a safe place for the issues to come out. Um, and what are some ways that you've offered for your students to share their experiences with you or with classmates or just personally, privately? Um, I had a student who shared with me that uh, she had become homeless in the, in the last few weeks of school. And up until that time, she had been working to try and maintain her family's living arrangement, you know, working too many hours and trying to squeeze school in on the side. We knew that she was struggling, we just didn't know why. And eventually she told us why. She didn't share because she thought she would be removed from the school. But I think if students share anything with you at all, it's because you've given them the time you've greeted them, they know that you are a warm person willing to hear their story. Um, one of the ways that I do include um, issues in my classroom is you can make it a choice what they study about. So if you're, we were studying um, A Raisin in the Sun this year, there was an excerpt in our textbook, and I put in other things around it that were contemporary um, even in our community. And the students were free to say things like, oh yeah, I've seen that, or I've heard about that. And every once in a while in a, in a dialogic journal, a student might write, I've, I've felt that, I've experienced that. Um, so if you, if you have journals, if you allow it to be an option in their research or in their writing or in their reading, um, if you don't shy away from the difficult conversations, but welcome them, you'll hear them. And what about for the younger kids in elementary school? I had a third grader who came to class one time, and he was so upset because this was when there were rumors of, if not true, raids in our community by ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. And he had been told by his family, do not open the door, do not open the windows, and you cannot go outside and play after school. And he came to school, and he just came right up to my desk and said, guess what my family said? I won't tell you which one. <laughs> guess what my family said? And he just started talking and talking and talking. And I just received it. I didn't shut him down, I didn't say, hold on, we have a lesson to do here. I gave him the space and the other students started sharing. And then at the end, I was like, it sounds like you guys are going through some difficult situations. Who do you talk to when you need help? And do, do you know that you can always talk to your guidance counselor? Do you know you can always talk to me? And um, please be safe. So you don't have to solve their problem, but if you give them a chance to talk about it, it's helpful to them. And the next day get back to the lesson. <laughs> right. And you're also finding ways to, as you said, connect it to the curriculum so that you're giving them a chance to sort of think about these topics in kind of a broader opportunity mm -hmm. as well, right? Anytime you can work in your classroom to help other people understand the broader issues, um, you're helping dreamers, you're helping undocumented students. Um, tell their own stories. Be who they need to be. Find out who they are. Find out their place. 
um, because all the stress that comes from not feeling like they belong uh, causes more trouble than we can solve if we just let them be who they are. And so some of the, the work that one of my colleagues does is counter stories and really trying to help the students see themselves in books, in movies, and tell their own stories and really celebrate who they are. So her voice runs in my head all the time. And I think this is a good time to mention that you have a new book coming out, so we'd love to share that with our audience. Thank you. I'm one of four editors, and um, myself and another teacher and two professors. And it's called Teachers as Allies, Transformative Practices for Teaching Dreamers and Undocumented Students. And it's coming out through Teachers College Press in the fall. It actually came from a student. The inspiration to write the book came from a woman who was undocumented at the time and now she's documented and she told the story of she told her own story at a conference and then she also shared that her father was um, in the deportation process and how she was fighting to um, make sure that he was not deported and um, she inspired those of us gathered so much that we all went out to lunch and said we need to get this word out to other teachers and so it started out as are you listening because we thought we would share more and more stories um, and through that we gathered a lot of student stories we listened to our own stories student stories differently and our book is, starts out with something called dilemmas and how you understand your students through your own lens and how you need to look deeper and really um, understand your students more broadly and it goes from that chapter all the way to the call of action call to action which is be mindful understand what your students are going through understand their challenges within your curriculum um, and don't be afraid to be politically active. You have an in-house voice and you have your I am a citizen voice and you can use both to support your students. Again, I think it goes back to how we started and really building that trust and being open to the discussion. I think that I know for me, I'm going to be working with my colleagues to get on the same page as to, so we have a consistent voice. If this comes up, what are we going to do? I think that's respectful of my colleagues as well as, um, as well as the students. Do you find yourself thinking about the upcoming school year in a different way than normal this year, sort of given the current climate and issues that kids are, are uh, facing? I think for me in high school, it's going to be um, very vibrant, very active. The students will be s strong, critical thinkers because that's the environment that we're in. Um, I welcome their questioning of what we're saying and what we're doing. Um, you know, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we reading about this? I think that's fair. And I think it's fair to use another um, chapter in, one, in our book. It talks about using music and really analyzing the language used in music. Um, why not? Why not bring up the music and have the students listen to it, analyze the language used in it? Um, they need to feel like they, the bottom line is they're not gonna leave their issues at the schoolhouse door. So you can either embrace it and be very thoughtful and careful about how you address it um, and respectful to them and how they're feeling, or you can pretend it doesn't exist and they're going to think it's foolish. In the English language classroom, I think that if you're teaching modals, why not? What would you do? What could you do? What should you do? Why not teach that? Um, and it doesn't have to be about the issue specifically, 
but that issue might come out in their dialogue journals or the issue might come out in a presentation that they do. Because not every student in your class is going to have the same issues, but they're friends of kids who do. And so ignoring the issues is to our detriment. Well, I want to um, ask you about someone that you had told me about, Dr. Sandra Naval in yes. New York City, and said that she had talked about her experiences of being celebrated as yes. a child. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, that's, a, that's the person I was alluding to when I talked about the counter stories. And she really um, treasured and continues to treasure that experience of being accepted for who she is and um, as a Haitian immigrant and her language was accepted. She, um, her intelligence was celebrated. There was no altering of the curriculum in order to make it so simplified that it was offensive. Like she was challenged. She grew to become Dr. Sandra Duval and um, she's contributing now asking us as English learn uh, teachers of English learners to celebrate our students in the same way because she saw how it works and she has this whole framework called roots and wings and if you give students roots they will find they will form their wings to fly so um, I really like listening to her stuff you can find her online too she's a, a great resource that's great yeah. thank you um, I wanted to uh, uh, change gears a little bit, um, talking about advocacy and the roles that the ESOL teachers are playing in their school community, particularly around questions of special education, identifying children's needs, um, particular services, and how you see the role, particularly of ELL, ESOL, bilingual specialists in that area. Well, I think that um, primarily the English learn the teacher of the child needs to be at the table um, because there are often we have to look much much deeper in the whole process of language learning and understanding what their process was for learning their first language um, really welcoming the parents in and understanding what the process was for that child as they were growing up um, what has there been any birth trauma or was there any were there any social emotional or poverty issues that impacted their learning up until this time um, it's it's a really tricky decision to make whether an ESOL student is also impacted by special needs um, so the most important thing is that everybody's interpreting the data, everybody's doing observations. Um, and don't hold back, don't shy away from it. Become part of the conversation. Ask your colleagues to think critically, think, think deeper. Um, it's very painful to a parent to be um, getting the news that their child has special needs because that's yet another thing they can't understand and how in the United States that is actually a supportive process um, because in their countries, a lot of countries, not all, um, they, it's not a supportive process to be identified as a student with special needs. Um, so we have to be careful with that, that whole process and really understand the families and get good data. We had been talking a little bit about myths about English language learners, and one is that you know if the parent doesn't isn't necessarily very visible at the mm -hmm. school in the way that you as an American teacher are expecting, that's an indication of a problem or sort of a lack of something, which couldn't be farther from the truth. <laughs> but I think that's something that uh, teachers who are new to working with English language learners need to understand a little bit more. We do, we do hear that a lot. Oh, they don't value education. What, what, what it is, is their valuing doesn't manifest the same way as maybe mine does from my white middle class perspective. Um, and I think that it's important to not lump all of our students together, even if they're from the same culture, because there are strata within the culture. 
and why they're here and who, uh, you know, what process they took to get here. All of these things are factors that are important to know. I do, I do know that a lot of us are like, well, let me just work with what's presented to me. Um, but um, Dr. Sylvia Sanchez and Ava Thorpe, Dr. Ava Thorpe, also in our book, would tell you in their dilemmas process that you have to look deeper. You need to slow the train down and you have to really look deeper and try and figure out more about that student. Check your own cultural perspectives and really understand the circumstance before making any decisions. So, um, Chapter. It's a good, that's a good chapter. That's a good chapter of the book. Yes, um, and you, um, you yourself, in your own population, you have quite a range of kids who are here for different reasons. And because we're in Washington, that is particularly interesting. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Um, I have gone to. I have worked in a few different schools, and but more recently, I've worked in two schools that have mixed populations of um, people here to work at NIH um, or in the diplomatic corps or um, the military of different countries um, coming here to work with us, help us, learn from us. It's a two-way street. Those parents are a little bit different than the ones um, who are struggling, the ones who are here living in poverty um, working two and three jobs. They might come from the same country, but they're very different. So um, we can't just stick to the books that tell us all about the students from thus and so country because they may not be the students that end up in our classroom. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for one more question, so I want to ask you about your science work because I know this mm. is a passion and it's something I had uh, the great fortune to see you present with Zebby Zakarian, another uh, friend of our project um, in TESOL, maybe that was at Toronto. I can't remember which conference it was, but um, I would love to n hear more about it and why science in particular was something that was such a great success with your kids. I think that um, any time the kids have control over something, they enjoy it. Um, and so when we, we grow seeds and and a student actually gave me this idea to grow the seeds in a clear cup so you can see the roots um, and put your seed not in the middle of the soil but down the edge of the, the cup so you can see it sprout out. I mean, he's, he was an incredible student. Um, he uh, gave me that idea early in my elementary career and it just lasted over the years. But anytime you're working with butterflies, plants, um, we, I had students design volcanoes one year <laughs> and create tornadoes in a bottle, but they had to work together to, to design it. They had to say why things didn't work and why things did. Um, anything that gets their hands on, gets their hands dirty. Even some of my students didn't like getting their hands dirty when they had to plant the recycled paper that they made, <laughs> that they had infused with seeds. They were like, um, you have gloves. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, it's, it's fun. You just encourage them and encourage them. If they don't want to do it, that's, that's different. But um, they usually come around when they see the other kids jumping right in. Um, anything. I'm not working there anymore, so I can tell you we threw pumpkins off the side of the building to talk about um, what would happen, prediction, what would happen if you threw this small pumpkin into that bucket of water? How far would the splash go? And they were predicting how far it would go and measuring um, all of these things. I have fish in my classroom and in the elementary school because of one particular student, but it grew into everybody wanted to take care of the fish and it was theirs. It, they owned it. Um, we, I had a plant that likes to go for the sun, so we would plant a pencil in the side of the container and turn it around and say, how long do you think it's going to take for these leaves to touch the sun again? And they would write their predictions on a piece of paper on the wall and 
every couple of days and oh I didn't win <laughs> you know just just adding the language of prediction it it's just science it makes it more fun you know we can predict in stories too and that gets added on later but when they feel it and they touch it they they do it they see it it's theirs <laughs> And so it's it's fun, and then also makes them want to come to class. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned your student with the the fish. That remind mm -hmm. me of another student story you had of the two girls. We've been talking about student stories and experiences. And that was in middle school, and um, one was Eritrean and one was Ethiopian. Oh, excuse me. Which, no, it's critical, mm -hmm. right? Because where else would they come together and be such good friends? So. Um, they were in a situation where they had heard uh, they were in a class and the teacher used to give the kids a bonus on Friday and bring in donuts if they'd finished their work and the teacher unfortunately um, not thinking said if you don't do your work you, you can starve like Ethiopians and um, that crushed both of them and they came running down the hall crying what are we going to do? And so actually we sat and talked about it. I said, what do you want to do? And we came up with this plan together where they would teach him more about themselves. And I said, he doesn't know what it means to be Ethiopian. And so they brought in their family albums. They talked to him about their families and the struggles between their two parts of the world and how great it was that they became friends. and. They asked him to put their flags on his desk, and they asked him to apologize. Mm -hmm. And he did. Mm -hmm. He did all that. I thought it was very strong of him to receive that feedback from the students, and they were incredibly strong to be patient and present their side to their teacher. So. And to see themselves as teachers. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. before we uh, finish, would you be wearing this beautiful butterfly? Would yeah. you um, tell us what is the inspiration behind that? Um, ever since I was young, Madeleine Albright has been a role model. Um, and she always wore pins on her shoulder. And the reason why she touches me as an English, as a teacher of English learners, is um, she said when she got here, she learned to love the United States because it welcomed her. So she's, she was an, in an immigrant family, and mm -hmm. a Jewish immigrant family. And then went on to represent it internationally yes. as our Secretary of State. So thank yes. you. I think that's a, a great note on which to end. So thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in today for this Facebook Live chat. And I know you're going to want to share this with your friends and colleagues. and take a lot of Anne Marie's ideas back. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we will make sure you have the archive available both on Facebook and on Colorado, Colorado. And we want to thank one more time the National Education Association for making this series of events possible, that giving this opportunity to speak with such great um, advocates like Anne Marie. It's been a dream of mine to have you on this thank you. website for a long time. So um, I'm, I'm really happy this worked out. Um, and also to thank the American Federation of Teachers for all of their great support of Colorado, Colorado. So thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you in our next Facebook Live event coming soon. Bye.